Photoelectric Effect. The operation of a large number of devices, some very common in daily life, such as the one that controls the closing of the door of this elevator, is related to the so-called photoelectric effect, which is what this video will be about. The elevator door doesn't close while I'm here, but it does if I step back. Why? The door remains open because a beam of non-visible light that goes from this side to the other side is interrupted. The beam of light regulates an electrical circuit that controls the closing of the door. That's why if I exit and let the beam of light reach the other side, the door closes. The emission of electrons by a material when it is lighted up is called photoelectric effect and its discovery dates back to the late 19th century. In a broad sense, the photoelectric effect also refers to processes induced by the absorption of light, such as the extraction of electrons and gases and the excitation of electrons in semiconductor materials that is used in devices such as those that control the opening and closing of the elevator door or those that convert light energy into electricity. In the year 1888, the German physicist Heinrich Hertz observed in the course of his research on electromagnetic waves that electrical discharges between two electrodes occurred more intensely when lighted with ultraviolet light. He wrote down his results but did not try to find an explanation for the phenomenon. A few years later, in 1899, the Hungarian-German physicist Philip Leonard showed that the irradiation of metals with ultraviolet light can produce the emission of negative charges or electrons. This emission can be shown with a simple experiment that we have prepared in the laboratory. Let us see it. Here we have a metallic aluminum plate that we light up with this lamp. To detect the emission of electrons, we are going to use an electroscope that we have made with this glass jar. In its lid, we have drilled a hole. Through it, we introduce into the bottle an electrical insulating plastic tube containing a conductive wire, in our case, a metal clip from which we have hung two small sheets of aluminum foil, which are also conductive. Here we have the electroscope completely assembled. Let's see how it detects the presence of electric charge in the metal plate. To do this, we first sand the plate to eliminate the superficial layer of oxide that reduces its conductivity, and then we load it by gluing a piece of tape that we have previously charged. We observe how the aluminum sheets have separated as both have been charged through the conductive wire with charges of the same sign, indicating the presence of charge in the plate. The sign of the charge on the metal plate is the same as on the adhesive tape. We can obtain two pieces of tape with opposite charges by superimposing and then separating them. In this way, both pieces are loaded by friction with charges of the opposite sign, as can be seen by the attraction that they experience with each other. We do not know beforehand whether the piece of tape that we have used was positively or negatively charged, since in both cases the separation of the sheets in the electroscope takes place. However, if we light up the plate with ultraviolet light, we can verify that a different effect is produced in each case. To do this, we repeat the process by gluing one of the previously charged pieces of tape. We note that the electroscope is charged again and the sheets are separated. If we now light it with a lamp, It has no effect. Let us try the other piece. We discharge the plate by touching it, remove the piece of tape, and stick the other piece that we have prepared. We have charged again the electroscope, and if we light it up, the sheets meet, indicating the discharge of the metal plate. 
Therefore, we can conclude that the impact of ultraviolet light on the plate produces the emission of positive or negative electric charges. We can verify that it is an emission of negative charges or electrons by refining our experimental setup. We connect the metal plate to the negative pole of a high voltage source and the positive pole to this copper spiral. We have prepared a circuit to measure with this multimeter any current flow between the plate and the spiral. We can see that when connecting the voltage source between 0 and, for example, 5 kilovolts, there is no current flow, since it is an open circuit because the plate and the spiral are separated and the multimeter marks 0. Let's see what happens if we light up the plate with our lamp. The multimeter registers current flow. Because the spiral is connected to the positive pole, we conclude that there are negative charges, or electrons, that leave the plate and are attracted by the spiral, forming a current called photoelectric. We can corroborate this conclusion by reversing the connections, connecting the positive pole to the metal plate, and the negative to the copper spiral. and we check that there is no current flow despite the incidence of light. In this case, the negative charges emitted are retained in the plate because of the applied voltage. This experimental setup is similar to the one that allowed Leonard to study the photoelectric effect, except for the fact that the metal plate and the copper spiral are not in a vacuum chamber, so the emitted electrons collide with the molecules of the air, which varies the photoelectric current. However, we can use our experiment to study some qualitative features of the phenomenon. Among these features, Leonard discovered that the maximum energy of the emitted electrons depends on the frequency of the light used. The higher the frequency, or equivalently, the lower the wavelength, the greater the maximum speed. Moreover, for each metal, there is a minimum frequency of the incident light for the photoelectric effect to be produced. Thus, for potassium, the visible red light does not produce the effect, but the green or violet light does since its frequency is higher. For the aluminium plate, the minimum frequency corresponds to ultraviolet non-visible light. The lamp used produces both visible light, the reflection of which is observed in the plate, and ultraviolet non-visible light of greater frequency that produces the photoelectric effect. This can be checked with a glass like this that absorbs ultraviolet light. Thus, if we place the glass between the lamp and the plate, the current ceases immediately. This experimental setup also allows us to show another feature of the photoelectric effect. The intensity of the electric current recorded by the multimeter depends on the luminous intensity that reaches the metal plate. To show this, we just need to compare the intensities recorded in the multimeter when we use one, or two ultraviolet lamps. We see that the higher the luminous intensity, the grayer the electrical intensity. Although this last result could be understood using the classical electromagnetic theory, according to which the higher the incident light energy, the greater the electrical energy, a deep understanding of the photoelectric effect, which also allows to understand its other features, is only possible within the framework of quantum physics. In fact, the understanding of the photoelectric effect at the beginning of the 20th century was a milestone in the development of quantum theory. In 1905, the German physicist Albert Einstein proposed an explanation of the photoelectric effect based on a hypothesis that another German physicist, Max Planck, had formulated in 1900. This was that luminous energy is constituted of independent packets, or quanta, later called photons, and that the energy of each photon is proportional to the frequency. The constant of proportionality, h, is called Planck's constant. According to Einstein, when a photon hits the material, it may transfer its energy to one of the electrons. If the energy is sufficient, one part B is used to tear the electron away from the material, and the remaining part, Te, is converted into the motion energy or kinetic energy of the electron. Since the kinetic energy is equal to half the product of the mass and the square of the velocity, 
it is clear that the emitted electrons that are less bound, that is, with minimal b, have the maximum velocity. This makes it possible to understand the dependence of the maximum speed of the electrons with the frequency, or equivalently with the wavelength of the light used. It also explains the existence of a minimum frequency for each material, nu minimum, in order to produce the photoelectric effect. This corresponds to h nu minimum equal to b minimum because with a lower frequency, the photons do not have enough energy to extract electrons from the material. On the other hand, the photoelectric current intensity is proportional to the number of electrons emitted and therefore to the number of incident photons, which in turn is proportional to the light intensity. Thus, if we use two lamps, we increase the light intensity and the electric current. When Einstein proposed this explanation, data was not accurate. Later, in 1914, an American physicist, Robert Millikan, refined the experiments and verified the explanation. Since then, there have been many applications of the photoelectric effect, as in the closing of the elevator door, the switching on and off of public streetlights, or the production of electricity from sunlight. This is a clear example of how basic research on the interaction of light with matter gives rise later to technological developments, some of which may not yet be discovered. Yeah.